Hello and welcome back to An Old Man Watches and today I'm going to be talking about the evolution of the Godzilla franchise uh, through the 1960s. Um, so as you may remember if you watched the video I recorded recently, um, the first Godzilla film came out in 1954. So we'll start with a little background to get us from 1954 to the mid-60s when this crop of films begins. Uh, and the success of that first film inevitably led to the filming of a quick sequel, uh, which came out in 1955 and was called Godzilla Raids Again. This introduced a second giant radioactive lizard, conveniently identical to the first, uh, as well as featuring the debut of a new giant monster, Angyrus. Uh, Godzilla Raids Again was a commercial success in Japan, just like the first film, but it did not immediately lead to any more films. In fact, it would be seven years before Big G returned to the big screen uh, with the 1962 offering King Kong vs. Godzilla. Uh, that film was a worldwide success, recouping nearly 20 times its budget in box office rentals, uh, which appears to be have been the catalyst for production company Toho to start pumping out Godzilla films on a near annual basis. One thing to note about God, uh, King Kong vs. Godzilla, if you've ever heard the urban myth that there are two versions, King Kong wins in the Western version and Godzilla wins in the Japanese version, it's not true. Uh, Godzilla was a bad guy in 1962. King Kong wins in the movie in all versions. But carrying on, uh, the remaining years of the 60s would see Toho release seven new Godzilla films, two in 1964, and then one every year thereafter for the rest of the decade. The first film off the mark was Mothra vs. Godzilla, in which a giant moth and its pixie-sized attendants attempt to protect the world from everyone's favourite atomic lizard. Uh, later that same year, Godzilla faced off with Ghidorah, a three-headed dragon that devastated Venus and planned to do the same to Earth. After that came Invasion of the Astro Monster, Ebera, horror, horror of the Deep, Son of Godzilla, Destroy All Monsters, and All Monsters Attack. Now, I'm not going to summarise the plots of those films individually, because that would make for a long and, frankly, rather repetitive video. Instead, I'm going to talk about the overall trends and themes of the franchise through this decade. Now, one thing I'd note before we start is, unlike the 1954 original and its immediate sequel, which are black and white films, all of these movies are in colour. I'm not convinced that this is wholly to their benefit. Monochrome had a lot of flaws in the suits and sets, as well as in the composite shots using overlays of people against green screens. Godzilla's most, most impressive rampage for a long time, certainly through this decade, would still be that of the original film. And if, you, you know, like if you're only going to watch one Godzilla film from the original Toho incarnation, uh, like anything before sort of the year 2000 watch the 1954 one. But that said, you know, the thing about to Godzilla rampaging through Tokyo is there's only so many ways you can vary it up. Toho recognised that from the very start, so even as early as Godzilla raids again, they'd figured out a strategy to mix things up, which is to add more monsters. If you give Godzilla another kaiju to fight, then you can fill up screen time introducing the new menace and revealing its powers over potentially multiple fight scenes. Those powers also allow you to create new damp dynamics to the fight scenes. How does Godzilla deal with an enemy that can fly, or that sprays webbing, or that comes in packs, so it's not a one-on-one -on -one fight at all? And so we get new monsters making their debuts in these movies, or at least their debuts in a Godzilla film. Many of them had actually appeared elsewhere first. Mothra had had their, its own movie, for instance. Rodan had had its own movie, and so forth. Uh, only nine, but only 1965's Invasion of the Astro Monster relies entirely on monsters that had previously appeared in a Godzilla film. Every other movie from this era introduces at least one new-to-the-franchise enemy. So this provides plenty of additional variety to the films, and it gives something for Godzilla to do other than rampaging through Tokyo yet again. However, giving Godzilla other monsters to fight does present you with a new problem. Big G is your title character, but he's a villain so he's generally going to have to lose at the end of the film. If the enemy monsters beat him, that's going to undermine his status as a threat. And also, when Godzilla comes back, as he inevitably will, because you want to make money, the audience will be asking, well, hang on a second, where's that monster that beat him last time? Why aren't they beating him again? Why should we be worried? So Godzilla needs to win these fights, or at least most of them. And if he's mostly going to win, well, then maybe the best strategy is to make him the hero? 
Uh, Toho didn't pull the trigger on this idea immediately. Mothra versus Godzilla still has the giant lizard as a rampaging menace, uh, with Mothra as the, the good monster. But later that same year, Big G made his face turn when Ghidorah, the three-headed monster, threatened to destroy the Earth and only the combined might of all of Earth's kaiju, Godzilla, Mothra and Rodan, could defeat it. While Godzilla's defense of the planet in this film was reluctant, he wasn't terribly fond of humans after all, uh, the face turn stuck and throughout the rest of the decade and into the 70s, Godzilla would consistently take up the role of humanity's defender, or at least the Earth's defender, against giant monsters and malevolent aliens. Uh, the latter appear in both Invasion of the Astro Monster and Destroy All Monsters, menacing the Earth via their ability to, at least temporarily, seize control of monsters. Now, Godzilla's transition to good guy extended not just to why he fought, but how he acted and looked. Uh, he became more playful in his behaviour, allowing for visual humour of varying levels of success, uh, and the suit had a significant redesign over the course of the decade that made it less menacing. The original's heavy, menacing brow line was softened, his eyes became much larger and more human-looking, and the long, reptilian snout also got shortened and pushed in, making the face overall almost like that of a scaly ape rather than a lizard. Now, Godzilla's makeover to be sort of more approachable and cute also spoke to the other major trend of the 60s films, which was more and more of a focus on the younger audience. Now, this began simply as an attempt to broaden the prospective audience. Uh, marketing just to adults, as the original films had done, because they were deemed rather too sombre for kids, um, was seen as too limiting in the face of the rising competition from television during the 60s. Over time, however, and especially after Godzilla made the switch to Defender of the Planet, the film skewed more and more heavily towards a younger audience. Uh, invasion of the Astro Monster sees Godzilla doing his best Muhammad Ali impression mid-fight and breaking out some boxing moves, as well as doing celebratory jumping jacks after his inevitable victory. Uh, and this trend reached its culmination in the tedious Son of Godzilla, in which Big G gets a nominally cute offspring and tries to teach it how to roar and breathe atomic fire, and in the execrable all monsters attack, which compounds the sins of its nonsensical, mostly imaginary, even in the world of the film narrative, by relying very heavily on recycled footage from earlier movies. Overall, I don't think the 60s Godzilla films are particularly good. That's probably not that big of a surprise, really. Uh, but what might be is that many of them are actually quite dull. Uh, those targeted most specifically at younger audiences definitely won't hold the interest of anyone over about the age of seven, but even the others are generally only worthwhile watches for kaiju completists. If you're not a part of that audience, but you still want to sample a film from the era, then I'd say Destroy All Monsters is not a bad choice. It has plenty of different kaiju appearing on screen, there's a good multi-monster rampage through Tokyo, and I very much enjoyed uh, its overall visual look. It has a Thunderbirds-esque design to it, uh, particularly with things like the SY-3 spaceship and the underground base with the massive hatch in the top of the mountain. Uh, very, very Jerry Anderson vibes from that film. So that's 60s Godzilla. Next time, we go back to a period of history when movies about Marvel superheroes still seemed like a gamble, and almost nobody knew who Hugh Jackman was, with 2000's X-Men. But that's next time. Until then, thanks for watching this video, and I hope you enjoyed it.